um, President Mark, uh, fellow Rotarians, um, I was just looking around to see whether Peter Cullen was here today. Uh, and I think there's probably a very good reason why he's not, because um, I was going to ask him to give an explanation as to why he was um, confused for um, Sir Michael Cullen at one of his uh, recent <laughs> breakfasts, as was outlined in the paper um, last week, uh, mistaken identity. Um, so I, I, I guess we'd find um, um, Peter in his uh, absence. But firstly, I was going to say I think we should all uh, put something into uh, into, into, into our contribution box for the fact that uh, the latest uh, survey from um, Deutsche Bank in terms of ranking Wellington as the number one international capital in the world, which I think was wonderful news, and I think there's a whole lot of people in Rotary, and particularly Kerry, who's done hard work over the years too, and ensuring we've achieved that status. So I think you should all pay up for that, um, for that uh, acknowledgement, which was um, uh, an amazing achievement. Um, it goes without saying this week that uh, one of the, the big news stories was um, the headline, The Duke Standing Down, I Can't, can't Stand Up for Much Longer. Um, when you think about uh, uh, his eight number of years of um, service as uh, Duke of Edinburgh, and that's my first question, for how long has Prince Philip um, performed his roles as the Duke of Edinburgh? Uh, 70 years. Absolutely. Uh, anyone who had any other thought, please uh, pay up. <laughs> and uh, second point, how many organisations was the Duke of Edinburgh a patron, president or a member of? Uh, seven, 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 eight. More than seven. Seven, eight. Yeah, 780. Once again, you've read, 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 read the paper. Um, anyone who didn't think it was 780, please pay up. <laughs> and obviously, he's, um, it's gone without saying that he's um, um, that amazing... Uh, a record, and I was quite intrigued to read a bit of his, his byline, byline. How many round the world voyages did he make on the Royal Yacht uh, Britannia? Two. One, two, or two. three? Two. two. Absolutely right. Anyone other than two, please pay up. And the island of the Pacific where he is regarded as a, or wished as a god? Tanya. Tanya. Absolutely right. Um, and his blood relationship um, with the present Queen um, is through what line? Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria, absolutely right. Both great grandchildren of Queen Victoria. But anyway, um, amazing service and uh, all the acknowledgements um, are, are what I'm truly due in that regard. Um, just a range of topics, one dear to my heart. Um, how many of you know uh, the name of the organisation Wakatu Incorporation? Those that don't should pay up. Um, the wonderful brand of wine um, owned by Wakatu Incorporation. Tohu. Tohu, absolutely right, Robert. Uh, and for those who don't know that, whereabouts are they based? Nelson. 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 Yeah, largest building in Nelson. Um, they, uh, they export sea cucumber um, and also have developed their own uh, variety of oyster, which they say rivals um, the bluff oyster. But um, for those who are not aware, there's been a, a landmark decision um, in the Supreme Court that was uh, issued um, a couple of months ago, um, proprietors of Wakatu versus the Attorney General. Does anyone know what that decision was about? It's the tenth land reservation uh, that was imposed upon the New Zealand company. Um, and all I can say is, um, you know, God bless the, uh, the Chief Justice, uh, Dame Shana Lars. I commend that decision to you if you want to read a fascinating history about New Zealand, the New Zealand Land Company and the acquisitions of land from Māori. But um, in that particular case, um, that was basically when the land company was, New Zealand Land Company was authorised to sell land. Uh, it was originally vested in the, um, in the Crown and one-tenth was to be reserved for um, local Māori. And in the case of Dawson, there was 151,000 acres which the New Zealand company was entitled to deal with, uh, which meant there was uh, 15,100 acres to be reserved for local Māori and Nilsen. And of that uh, amount, 10,000 acres was, um, was never received. Now, this was back in 1841, and this decision by the Supreme Court, and it has um, some quite wide-ranging uh, implications for the other Māori organisation who is named after the uh, 10th land reservation. Does anyone have any clues as to who that is? 
or even intended trust, absolutely, who'll be following this decision with interest, because the Supreme Court said that notwithstanding that these land acquisitions took place back in 1845, um, the Crown had breached its fiduciary duty to protect the local Māori in the Nelson area in respect of the 15,000 uh, 100 acres that was reserved for them. So, as I said, for those who have an interest in uh, New Zealand history, I do commend the Chief Justice's very learned decision, which does run for a number of pages, and it's a, a large decision, but it has huge implications. Is there a one-page summary? Uh, <laughs> Robert, there's a, there's a five-page press release, which uh, I, I, I can send to you if you give me your email afterwards. Just moving along, the topic uh, dear to one's heart, the uh, NZRU held its uh, annual general meeting last uh, month and um, just wondered if anyone could tell me who, were, who was elected as uh, president and who was elected as vice president of the NZRU at their AGM. Any starters? President? You. No. <laughs> no, 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 no. I tried. Uh, Morris Trapp. And the vice president, who uh, was contesting the election against Blair Furlong and was successful, anyone starters? Bill Osborne. <laughs> now, the number of registered rugby players um, in New Zealand, um, anyone got a guess for that? Um, 120,000, 156,000, or 180,000? <laughs> Those who said 156,000, absolutely right. <laughs> The um, captain of the Black Ferns, highly successful team, what played rugby, wonderful rugby and trailblazers for New Zealand. Anyone know who that is? Sarah Goss. Absolutely right, Bruce. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the result of the for the financial year ending 31 December. Does anyone have any uh, ideas about uh, what that was? Break even. No, 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 no. <laughs> they made a loss of $7,473,000, which was um, very interesting because a lot of contributions to provincial unions, but I hasten to add for reassurance, um, uh, $91 million in reserves, and obviously they're hoping for a bumper year this year if anyone's tried to buy tickets for the Lions and been put off by the price. And just to continue with about site bias with my role with NZU Rugby, um, who was the very prominent a rugby player who died recently, who played yeah, both no, rugby union and rugby league. Yeah. Doug Rolston. Doug Rolston, absolutely correct. Anyone else who didn't, please pay up. <laughs> and uh, so I guess wearing a New Zealand University's hat, um, Doug says in his paper that uh, one of his highlights was captaining the New Zealand University's team. Um, in what match would that have been, and does anyone know the result? 1977. This is the British Isles. Yeah. And the score, Reese? 21-6 or 21-9. 21-9, 100%. <laughs> yeah. Everyone else, please pay up. And, uh, and I've asked by uh, Sam Whitelock as to why we're not playing the British Lions this year, and I've, I've told him to ask Stephen Chu, because it's, um, it is a pity that's the last major match that NZU played back in 1977, but we're an important nursery for the top two inches with uh, uh, Kieran Reid and Sam Whitelock and Conrad Smith all playing for our team. Actually, just about of interest, Rhys, you'd probably answer that. Who was the player that was selected in that 1977 team who made a huge difference uh, and had turned down the All Blacks twice uh, and was talked out of retirement to play for NZU in that match? Yeah. Represented New Zealand and the Empire Games in shot putting. I think he was ahead of his age too in terms of his bulk and um, was yeah, a lawyer and Greg, a lawyer in Auckland. Greg, um, Greg Denham. Greg Denham. I don't expect many of you to see, but he, he, he was he was a folklore and a legend. But I think that's my five minutes. And thank you for those who haven't paid up. Please pay up and uh, appreciate it. Thank you, President Mark. I'm not, I was sitting there thinking, is it a good thing or a bad thing that I don't have all this rugby trivia in my head? <laughs> <laughs> Undecided. <laughs> uh, so, yes, thank you, Mark. And special welcome to Sam, a guest of Andrew's who's here, setting up, as I understand it, the Wellington branch of the Student Volunteer Army. Isn't that just a fantastic 
thing that's just taken off. It's so impressive. Um, I guess the other thing I want to say, apropos of focusing on what the Youth Committee is or isn't up to, and I notice I sat at the table with Olivier, who's one of the members of our um, Youth Committee. Uh, more on that tomorrow night, Olivier. Uh, that um, just kind of a bit of scene setting. On the weekend, I knew I had one Youth Committee uh, responsibility on Saturday afternoon with John Nimmo and Tricia Walbridge actually. We spent some time selecting some nominees for the Roy McKenzie funded Outward Bound Scholarships. So that was my Saturday afternoon. And my very precious Saturday morning, which normally is given over to cycling around the bays and having a cup of coffee um, with Lee and others, I decided because I have responsibility now for the Youth Committee, I should go along to the strategic planning session. And I was a reluctant participant, to say the least. It was a beautiful day, and even though Mark offered great chocolate biscuits and a great view, I thought this was never going to make up for it. Um, I, I have to say, I found every moment of it really fascinating and engaging, and it was just great to spend the morning with a bunch of people who were on the front foot thinking about the issues that are facing Rotary, and thinking about it in a kind of outside of the box or whatever that cliche is kind of way. It was just wonderful. I enjoyed it. I found it really engaging um, and astonishingly I'd go back for more. So, you know. <laughs> anyway, so uh, uh, one of the things that made me aware of is that in my years in Rotary, stand back a bit Trace, in my years in Rotary I've been involved in a number of different subcommittees um, and when Andrew Jackson's dad became unwell last year I said I would look after the youth committee. It seems to me that that is simply a lens on some of the many things that Rotary does. So I'll just, having got the flashy thing of Patrick, forgot to do that first, um, I'll just do a little skip through what those are. Uh, but, but it was interesting being introduced and speaking briefly with Sam uh, when I arrived this morning because it seems to me that the club has got some fantastic <coughs> assets to offer and there are many things that we could wheel ourselves behind if you like and that the club itself doesn't have to be setting things up from scratch but rather we can be looking at what's going on in Wellington and, and uh, I, in the sense of greater Wellington actually and perhaps the Pacific and international community and saying what what where can Rotary add value to some things that are already happening? So uh, what the Youth Committee's got on its plate at the moment looks a little bit like this. So there's a whole, and uh, the student volunteer army is just one, there's a number of different initiatives, uh, obviously, going on in Wellington and the wider community already that we can look at ourselves as a Rotary Club and say, how can we get in behind these people? What can we offer? And my experience in Rotary is that Rotarians are incredibly good at using their networks. And I know that over the years I've belonged, what those networks consist of uh, really are changing a lot. I've worked a lot of time running my own business and now I'm working as a project manager in the public sector. So sometimes I think, oh, all my network at the moment is other public servants. But when, who was it asked me to do, uh, Derek Gill asked me to do something last week, after a few moments of thinking, I don't know anyone, about 10 seconds later I thought, yeah, actually I do. I know the solution, I know the people who are the solution to all of that problem. So I'm very aware that as there are youth initiatives uh, happening and underway with the energy of other organisations and young people in the, our community, then Rotary can bring our networks, our expertise, sometimes our fundraising, um, but certainly that kind of experience and the ability to shoulder tap one another and our wider circle is a critical part of that. Uh, so I think this is a thing that, uh, an aspect that the Youth Committee hasn't put a lot of time into and our job for me at the moment is to figure out what the appropriate um, horses are to be backing if you like. Um, so more of that a little bit later in the year. Um, the other thing is that Rotary has a wonderful history of providing uh, grants or scholarships for individual young people. And generally these are targeted at specific uh, parts of the demographic. So over the last few months we have sent a young woman from Wellington High to the National Science and Technology Forum. We've sent two other young people to the Rotary, entirely Rotary organised and funded Rotary Youth Leadership. What does the A stand for, Ryla? Award thing, yeah. Uh, which is kind of an experiential thing for people with great leadership potential. On Saturday, myself and John and Tricia were looking at uh, Sir Roy McKenzie funded 
uh, a whole a lot of places actually on a particular um, mind body and soul outward bound course for two weeks so we were selecting nominees for that uh, a couple of the members of our club have been helping with um, looking for nominees for the global study scholarships where, which are quite significant there's a bunch there's RIPEN so that legacy is still very much a part of what the Youth Committee takes its responsi is responsible for. Uh, my feeling at the moment about that is that there's a kind of a templated way to do those things, but I'm going to be looking around for anybody in the club to, to be some of the hands and feet um, in that regard. And I know that increasingly as Rotarians become busy with other things, it's actually quite hard to say, well, we're going to rely completely on Youth Committee members. Um, I know I've called a meeting for our little subcommittee tomorrow night and three of the members are out of the country at the moment. You know, that's just classic Rotary, isn't it? So um, just consider that we're going to cast our net wide for people to help with some of those uh, programs. The other responsibility that Rotary, uh, that the Youth Committee has been involved in, and I've been felt incredibly privileged to be part of this in the last few months, Tony Hassett and a couple of other people from the club have worked with a group of young people with a particular interest in setting up their own service-oriented organisation. And they've, as you probably know, they've called themselves SCOPE. We have an association with them. They're not formal members of this club, uh, but they are a group of about 12 or 13 young professionals in the kind of early but extremely uh, high-paced, I would say, parts of their career. And they have a, a specific interest in getting involved in programs to do with um, care for the environment and educational issues for younger people. So SCOPE is very much supported by our youth committee. I go along to their meetings when I can. Interestingly, when we met with them a couple of weeks ago, they were running their strategic planning discussion. It was one of the best facilitated sessions I've ever been at. And, I, and someone said at, the, at our strategic planning um, club strategic planning on the weekend, that, that we can offer mentorship. While that's true, I just sat there thinking, I wish I could take notes, because the young woman who was running this was superb. Um, and they just put, they're astonishing, they put their hands up and someone says, yeah, now I'll look after the website, I'm going to live in the UK, but I'll be able to do that for you online, you know? It's just phenomenal, very impressive. Um, so Scope will continue to be a really, I think, a great association for this club. Uh, clearly they're a different demographic um, to some of our own members, but I think the crossover of interests and the crossover of uh, rather different things that we can offer will be great, and I can already see a few things on the horizon where we can harness their energy and our own um, to do something a little bit differently. So uh, that's what the Youth Committee is about. My current thinking, and in particularly following along from the strategic planning discussion on Saturday, is that I would like the Youth Committee to be the hub of making sure things happen in the areas that Rotary wants to focus around um, young people. But that I would look to the whole club to do some of the work. Uh, and some of that's small, and we can chunk it, you know, big or small, whichever way we want to go. So that's the Youth Committee. Any other questions, come and see me. And if you're really keen and need a home, come to our meeting tomorrow night. You'd be very welcome. So just a quick one from me today, guys. Um, firstly, uh, update on where we're at with our nursery construction. So earlier in the year, we got a partner Bunnings on board who were happy to donate all of the um, tools and equipment we needed for our nursery. Thank you. And so over the course of a week in March, we had a whole lot of equipment turn up around about um, 40 post holes dug and then all of these Bunnings people there pouring cement and then the bottom right hand corner there is as far as we are at the moment. Um, in the next couple of weeks we've got some contractors coming in to finish the building and then do some irrigation and then from there we're set to start growing our own native seedlings. So from this year on we're going to be producing around about 5,000 native trees a year in this nursery to go on the Mount Vic project for Rotary Club of Wellington. And on top of that, another 5,000 trees a year which are being donated by the Wellington City Council and Forest and Bird. 
Um, the next thing to talk about is this year's planting opportunities. So we've set the three Saturday planting days for the Rotary Club to take part in for 10th of June, 1st of July and 5th of August. So if anyone who's interested in coming along wants to put those in their diary, um, you'll get more of that in your newsletter, I believe. Um, and then alongside those days, we'll also be doing a number of weekday planting days with schools, corporate groups and local community groups from Mount Vic. And then the final thing is our corporate tree planting challenge on Friday 9th of June. So this is in celebration of World Environment Day. As part of this, we invite corporate teams to send groups of up to 10 people along. Uh, we'll separate the planting site on um, alongside Government House into different areas and people will have two, two hours to plant as many trees as they can and then the winning team gets the trophy engraved with their name, take it back to their office and hang on the wall for a year um, and then the day will finish with a barbecue lunch. Participation's free for corporates so at the moment we've got a few teams signed up but we're looking for more so if any of you have any um, workplaces or contacts who might like to sign up a team of up to 10 people. Uh, I've got some flyers over here which you guys can take away and then just get in contact with me. And that's all. Brilliant.